I'm not going to talk about baptisms because I'm going to cry and you're going to, you're going to, uh, not going to, you nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see that. Good morning, Christ Church. Uh, it is great to be here today. Thank you for coming with us. Wasn't that an awesome? We had baptisms in the first service. We had baptisms in the second service. And any life, any changed life is, is a dramatic changed life. It's a radically changed life. And it's a testament to what God is doing and what God has done. And we get to kind of continue with that thought because we are just by God's, this, is, this was not planned, okay? Just by God's grace and just how he does things. We're gonna be in Ephesians uh, chapter two this morning. So I wanna, take, I wanna have you take your Bibles if you have one. If you don't have one, we got, we got some scripture on the screen and we've got Bibles in the seats in front of you if you wanna take that Bible and turn to Ephesians. Ephesians is in your New Testament. And um, if you're not familiar with that, you just kind of go to the gospels and just hang a right and keep going till you find a book called Ephesians. We're gonna be in verses four through 10 this morning. Uh, the bad news was last week. The good news is this week and uh, really excited about what God has. We're talking about dramatic, we're talking about dramatic, radical uh, alterations. And, and anybody ever noticed how some people look dramatically different in their social media profiles? Anybody? I mean, it's like, you, you know, you're, you're scrolling through, I don't have social media, but if I did, I would be scrolling through, right? You see somebody and then you go meet them in person and you're like, well, something's not adding up. All right, there's been some alterations. You, you got like 18 filters on your face in your social media profile right now, right? I mean, and they're like, no, 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 that's the real me. It was just not a good day. And we're like, yeah, sure, uh-huh, sure. Um, we've all had a family member. We've all had a friend who's had some dramatic alterations in their life. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a dramatic weight loss. Maybe it's a fashion style, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, wow, this person went from geek to chic, right? This is a dramatic change. Maybe it's, maybe it's I'm thinking of haircuts, um, well, I live in the Kleberger household, and on down through growing up, we've had some dramatic haircuts. Starting with me, I would have, you've only seen me like this. This is, this is what I've always been to you, and I do that for a reason. If you want an explanation, I'll talk to you after church, okay? But um, I used to have really long hair, and once in a while, I would just shave it. I would just shave it off, and just randomly. And um, my mom, well, my mom, my mom has, you know, my mom had this beautiful long blonde hair. My dad likes long blonde hair. And once in a while, once in a great while, my mom, when I was a kid, would come home and her hair would be short. Now that's like, that's a, that's a riff in the Kleberger family because my dad likes long hair. And all of a sudden he's looking at his wife who has short hair. I, I think the best haircut story in, in the Kleberger household is my sister, Amanda. Amanda, when she was, um, she was a little baby. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how old she was, but she was tiny. She had long stringy hair. And uh, my dad, my dad, Listen, this is, I could tell you a hundred stories of my dad doing this kind of stuff, okay? My dad had a friend who had a friend who was from India who said, hey, you, you don't want to know the secret, the long, thick hair, you just shave their head. And my dad's like, makes sense. And he took his clippers and he shaved my uh, sister Amanda's head. She was bald. She didn't, he didn't have a conference with my my mom or anything. My mom actually was gone someplace. She came home and uh, her baby, Amanda, was bald-headed and staring at her with a smile. That caused a little bit of a ruckus. Talk about dramatic alterations. And um, that's what I want to talk about today. Radical, like not just a new look, right? Not just a new hairstyle, but a change from, I mean, this is dramatic in Ephesians. It's a change from death. Yes, I said it, death. Death means death, right? Death to life. So I wanna, I wanna get after it uh, today with you. I wanna give you the big idea today. That's kind of the big idea. It's the main sentence that lays over the text. And here it is. If you're taking notes or something, this is definitely what you're gonna wanna write down. If you forget anything, don't, for, don't forget this. Every Christian life is dramatically altered by God's glorious grace. Can I get an amen, church? Like we saw it this morning, right? Every Christian life is dramatically altered by God's glorious grace. Let's see what that means. Let's look at Ephesians this morning, chapter two. And uh, I kind of just want to kind of start with one. We're going to be looking at verses four through 10. I want to start with verse one to give us the context of our deadness, okay? So uh, follow along with me as I read. Or look up at the screen, here it says, Paul says, 
and you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature uh, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Oh, here it is. This is the big contrast clause in scripture. Here it is. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that, it's a big hinge right there, okay? So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I think the question this morning, as we look at this, we're going to be looking at some dramatic alterations, okay? Uh, spiritually dramatic, supernatural, radical, utter alterations. And the question is, like, how is my life dramatically altered? And we see this in verses 1 through 10. Now, we're going to be focusing on 4 through 10, but I've got three this morning. You ready for it? Three dramatic Alteration. So if you're taking notes, just got three of them down. You can write them down. Here's the first one. Glorious grace means I'm amazed by God's power. You're like, okay, what's, what's God's power? I'm amazed by God's power. Now look at verses four through six. The context is that we were dead following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, engaging in our passions of the flesh and our desires, dead, hopeless, lost, spiritual zombies. What does it say? But God, okay? I can make all kinds of jokes on that right now, but I'll, let me just say this. This is the greatest conjunction in the Bible. Remember Schoolhouse Rock, anybody? Is that still going on today? Sesame Street, Schoolhouse Rock, conjunction, junction. Remember that? It was like the the whole imagery of a, of a train with the boxcars linked together, trying to help you understand these little words called conjunctions, the magic of these words that, what do they do? They hook up uh, phrases and they change everything. It's kind of like, like, like bacon and eggs, right? Like peanut butter and jelly, uh, coffee or tea, uh, sad but true. Oh, here's another one. Here's another one in Ephesians 2, 4 separated by death, dead in our trespasses and sins, but God, the greatest conjunction in the Bible. Now here comes the power that's gonna raise, up, raise us up out of death, but God, what does it say? Being rich in mercy. He could have just said, like Paul could have just said, like God being merciful, that would have been enough, wouldn't it? It would have been totally enough. But instead, Paul's like, God being rich in mercy. Listen, this is rich in mercy. This is not tight-fisted. This is not miserly. This is not poor. This is, this is lavish. This is extravagant. Some would say spendthrift, overabounding. It reminds me of Psalm 103. Is like, as high as the heaven, so great is your mercy. I was thinking about that in terms of our life. We have so much resource in our salvation. We are rich because God is rich in mercy. I was talking to somebody this week about brain use. Somebody said, to, I don't know if this is true. I, I kind of believe it is. Let's just agree it is. It's true. Let's just agree. 
we use, this person said to me, we use one-tenth of one percent of our brain. Now, that's kind of a lack of stewardship, isn't it? (laughs) Kind of, sort of. We use one-tenth of one percent of our brains. Now, I want you to think about that spiritually. Spiritually, we have all the resources. We have all the resources. We have God's rich mercy. But how many of us live like we're poor? We live like we're paupers. So rich in mercy, and why? Why? What's the motive behind all of this? Look what it says. God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. I'm sure Paul could have lined up a dozen or so adjectives, but he sort of just bails on that, and he just chooses one. He just says, great, great Great love. Now you see the sequence, right? Look at your Bibles real quick. Look at the sequence. It's like God loves and love is merciful and mercy is forgiving and et cetera and et cetera. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying salvation from death by great love. That's the motive. That's the motive. Now we love that because every every human heart aches for love. Am I right? I mean, every, every human soul aches aches for love. I mean, we eat up love stories. That's why we have like, I think it's, I think I've counted now like four different versions of the Hallmark channel. I mean, we have, we have so many versions of that and we love it. Um, the, the, the one love story that I hear mentioned all the time, never seen it, never read the book, never seen the movie, probably never will. The notebook, the notebook. I mean, I hear people, it's so popular. Why? Because I mean, the, the summary is will make you cry, right? I mean, just the, the plot summary of the movie is like you got this, you got this couple who fell in love as, as, as young kids and they were separated, right? Class, eco, eco, you know, uh, economics. Well, I don't know what it was, but they were, they, were, they were sort of separated. They went on through their own separate lives and then they came back together when they were older. The problem is, is the girl, I'm giving a spoiler alert, hardcore. Uh, the woman has what? Alzheimer's. And this just incredible love story, love everybody, everybody's looking for this kind of love, never, a love that never gives up, a love that's messiest in the hardest moments. And every once in a while, we get a glimpse of that. We get a glimpse of that. But mostly it's just when we think about cultural love, we think about cheap knockoffs, right? I mean, like we, we typically love what we like. That's, that's kind of our definition culturally of love. We love what we like. We love based on what attracts us. We love uh, things and people that suit us. We love uh, things and people that fit our formulas, that appeal to our preference. We love what we like, what makes God so great. He loves the exact opposite of everything he finds attractive. He has chosen to love the exact opposite of every single thing he finds attractive. He looked down at us sinful and separated from him and enemies of him and dead in our trespasses and sin. And he chose to set his love on us. He chose to see us as our, at our worst and he chose to love us. God doesn't look down and go, oh, well, there's somebody. They've really got it together. God doesn't look down and go, oh, well, there's some, hey, she's got real potential. That's not at all what happens. In fact, Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrated his great love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Still powerless, still hostile, still enemies, no obligation, no constraints, voluntary self-substitution. I love how Tim Keller puts it, putting ourselves where he deserved to be and putting himself where we deserve to be. Putting us in his righteousness and presence before God and exchanging that and putting, putting himself where we deserve to be, which is on the cross, suffering the wrath of God. That is great love and that is the motive, listen, salvation from death by love, and then it goes on into life, into life. From death to life. I mean, what does a dead man need most? 
Certainly not a coffin, right? (laughs) What does a dead man need most? He needs life. She needs life. And we're still tracking with the but God here, okay? This is falling right underneath but God. But God, even when we were dead, what does it say? Made us alive together with Christ. Now, what I think is funny is that Paul is like in mid-sentence. You know how sometimes you get excited and you just get, kind of get sidetracked? And Paul is like, listen, guys, but God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ, by grace you've been saved. Like he just kind of erupts, right? And then he goes right back to his uh, sentence, by grace you have been saved. God, even when we were dead, made us alive. Who can do that? Who can do that? Who can make a dead person alive? First observation here is that we are entirely cast in the passive in this statement. We have a subject, verb, object structure. But God, he's the one doing the action, made us alive. And notice the repetition in these verses, with Christ, in Christ, with Christ. The second observation is just this is that this is like hardcore identity stuff here. I mean, this is like, this is like major identity stuff here. What what were these guys and gals doing today? They were identifying with Christ in baptism. They were saying, I am no longer identified by my tribe. I'm no longer, think of all the things that compete with our identity or compete rather for our identity. Things, titles, what kind of tribe you're from, what targets you're living for. I'm living for my boyfriend. I'm living for my girlfriend. I'm living for tomorrow. I'm living for graduation. I'm living for my next promotion. Think about all the things that compete for your identity. Trials, I'm I'm my cancer. I'm my divorce. I'm I live, you know, I'm identified because uh, uh, by the fact that I've gotten betrayed or by the fact that I've been cheated on. And listen, No, 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 no. You are either identified by one of two things. That's it. Your your identity is either in death or it's in life. At the end of the day, when push comes to shove and you meet your maker, you, you live in an identity of death or you live in an identity of life. And I love that because if you're alive in Christ, who you are in Christ shapes everything that truly matters. Like being a Christian, okay? Being a Christian isn't an add-on or just another label. It is your primary defining identity. Your, Your profession is just a platform, right? Your profession is just a platform to live out your aliveness in God. How many times, though, do we talk to people and they're like, I'm a musician who happens to be a Christian. I'm a plumber who happens to be a Christian. I'm a CEO of a large company who happens to be a Christian. No, 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 Jack, you got it the other way around, right? You got it wrong. You're a Christian who happens to be an athlete. You're a Christian who happens to be a doctor, a plumber a construction worker, a pastor, a musician. Christian is your primary identity platform. Your, prof- your profession is just, it just goes along with who you are really in Christ. Look at, he says, I'm alive, I'm alive. None of these are subservient. I'm alive, but God made us alive. And look at what he says next. God raised us up. Do you see that? God raised us up. I love that. Raised, this idea of raised describes a shift in status, okay? It's, it's a shift in status. In fact, Philippians 1.20 says that we're not citizens of the earth anymore. We're citizens of what? We're citizens of heaven. He's raised us up in the heavenly places. The heavenly places is the place where God dwells. It's the heavenly realm. It's the presence of God. It, it reminds me of, that, that story in John 11, Lazarus, that's a great story, isn't it? He's dead and God's like, come out of the tomb. 
I love how Jesus says, loosen him. What is he doing in his clothes, his grave clothes? What do you think he's going to do? Roam around the cemetery for the rest of his life? Loosen him. Raise him up. Bring him to me. This is the idea of a shift in status. By the way, all of these are past tense. He's raised us up. If you have embraced Christ by faith and repentance, you have been raised up. You have been raised up, but notice the second thing. It doesn't stop there. Raised and what? Love this. Raised and seated. Again, this is all past tense. And by the way, if you go back to chapter one, what does God say about Christ? God worked the same power he works in us. He worked in Christ by raising Christ up and seating Christ in the heavenly places. It's just amazing that he's, he's saying the same thing about you and I. God gave us a seat right next to him in the heavens. This is all about access. This is all about relationship. I mean, listen, guys, this is, this is all about like, like you are raised above. You are raised above. You are raised above uh, every power and every force that could come against you. For the first time as Christians, we can wage war against the world ideology, against Satan himself, against our flesh, because we have a heavenly agenda. We have a new power. We have a new desire, a new will, a new disposition. We have a new direction. We're not just barely surviving. How many times have I said it? How many times all of us have lived the Christian life like we're just sort of like making it on a shoestring? This is all about being seated with Christ in a place of honor over every force, over every power, able to wage battle because Christ has already won That's like, that's total access to his authority and position, by the way. It's not under the weight of this world. I love how Paul says it. Paul says, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that great? Reminds me of Matthew 28, you know, like when, when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, go make disciples. I've won. I'm seated. I'm not running around figuring out what to do next. I'm not stressed. I'm not pacing. I'm not like scratching my head. I'm I'm seated, man. All authority and on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go go do it. Go make disciples. And he says, I will be, this heavenly places talk, right? I will be with you always. Or remember what he said on the cross? What's the last words on the cross? It is is finished. Don't you love that? That's, that's seated language, okay? It is finished, completely paid, satisfied, all the requirements. I don't need, Jesus says, to continue this work. You don't need to either. Receive it completely. Man, many of our problems, your problems, my problems, come because we don't grasp this. We don't rejoice in this. We don't practice the fact that We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You think about that for your own life. If this is true, what is it exactly you think that he can't do? There's nothing he can't do. The same God who raised Christ and seated Christ has raised all who believe, raised them and has seated them. Maybe you're facing, I don't know what you're going through today. Maybe you're facing some sort of pressure. Maybe it's a mountain of sin. It's just a pile of sin. Maybe it's a relationship that that feels just utterly, you know what I'm talking about? Like it's just, you just, it just feels, it feels broken. You don't want it to be broken, but it, it just feels broken. A situation, I don't know what your situation is, but you ever been in a situation that just seems like not overcomable. You know what I mean? It's just like, I can't do this. It just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like this is possible. I I just want to encourage you. If you're in Christ, you've been raised and you've been seated and God is not limited by our doubts. He specializes in miracles, man. He specializes in turning chaos into masterpieces. And and here's, here's two take-homes. We're on, we're moving. Okay. Reframe your narrative. Don't let the past 
define you. But don't stop there. Embrace the awe. This is, this is awe-inspiring. This is all motivating. He, God just didn't swoop in like a superhero when you had a coffee in hand and you were singing praises in church. You were a mess. You were in the ditch and God entered into that ditch and he entered into that mess. And that is awesome. I'm talking about awesome in every sense of the word. I'm talking about worshipful awesome. Measurable praise to the God who has come to the rescue. That's a life altered by glorious grace. You tracking with me? You tracking with me? Is that just point one? It is. I got two more points. Let's roll. I got 12 minutes and two points. Okay, let's go. Number two, dramatic alterations. Here's the second thing. Glorious grace means I'm aligned to God's purpose. That's so great. It kind of takes a turn here. You don't expect it to go here. What does God want to accomplish exactly? What does God really want out of this whole thing? Out of this whole thing that we've been talking about, death to life, to raise the seated, what does God want out of this? That's the underlying question. I just wanna let you know that God didn't save you for your own comfort, okay? That's the, 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 the hinge there, the so that, so that, that's the proof. That's a purpose statement. So that is a, purpose statement showing that he saved us for something bigger than our own comfort. Here it is. So that in the coming ages, here it is. He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You're like, Seth, what does that mean? Well, let me break it down. Coming ages means for eternity. And you know when the ages to come begin? I'll tell you when they come to begin, right now. When you receive Christ, when you receive Christ, the ages to come begin. Why? So that he can show his grace. You are saved not primarily to keep you out of hell. Thank the Lord, I'm not going to hell right? I mean, I'm, I'm all about that. Let's, let's be grateful for that. Let's celebrate that. But God didn't save you just to drag you out of hell. He saved you for way bigger than that. You were saved primarily so that God could shower his grace. God could shower his blessing. God could shower his riches on you. And by doing so, he's telling the story, his story, his story of grace through you. It's not just some generic grace. Look what it says. It's kind grace. Grace in kindness. That's awesome. And we get it, when it gets done, this is not just for now. This is forever, okay? Because when he gets done pouring out all his grace on you, you know what he does? He just holds you up and he shows you off to the angels to declare what kind of God he is. You see what I'm talking about? We're talking about glory here at the end of the day. We're talking about at the end of the day, his purpose in our salvation is immeasurable praise rising up. His purpose in your life and in your trial and in your valley and in your mountaintop is immeasurable praise rising up. That's his purpose. He wants to tell his magnificent, glorious story of grace through your life, through your life, through your life, through my life. And at the end, he gets, he gets the glory. He, he even emphasizes, look at what he says in verse eight. Hey, by the way, or by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. Guys, listen, this is not you. This is not your merit. This is not your performance. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. I love that he emphasizes this is not your doing. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. It's all God's grace from start to finish. Why? Again, so that, you see it at the end? Look at verse eight. Look at verse eight and nine. At the end, so that no one may boast. This is huge. Salvation isn't a self-boasting moment. Salvation isn't a, it's all about me moment. Look what I did and look where I came from. It's not about that. Jesus, all the time, every time, 
should be the hero. It's a Christ-exalting moment. And too often, what happens, and I think a lot of it's unintentionally, we flip the script, we flip the narrative upside down. You ever notice how testimonies can easily, be, easily become more about you than about Jesus? I mean, when I first came to Christ, when I was 21, I got this invite to, to be a backpacking guide for a Christian adventure group for the whole summer. And I was really looking forward to it. Uh, part of the gig was sharing your story around the fire. So we would take turns you know, at night when we're camping out in the woods, we'd share our story around the fire. And man, I didn't have a clue how to share my story. And um, I'd talk about how messed up my life was and all the struggles and all the junk I'd been through. And I just kept going on and on and on, like this message and on about how bad I was. And I wasn't even all that bad, to be honest. Um, it was a boast. And finally, my lead guy, I'll never forget this. He pulled me aside. And he's like, bro, Stop talking about yourself. And I'm like, well, it's my testimony. He's like, just make Jesus the hero, man. It changed, it changed my life. It's like, I didn't know how to tell my testimony. That, that makes sense. I didn't save myself. The highlight is not, I mean, that's, that's what happens, right? We slip into this sometimes, like sometimes we share our stories as if we're the star and Jesus is sort of the supporting character um, of our life. And we end up making it about our struggles more than his grace we emphasize our decision over his rescue. We talk about our feelings over facts. The reality is Jesus is the one who did the heavy lifting, period. He's the one who commands the center stage, not me, not you, but him, him. So I just think it's such a great alignment opportunity for us. To get back to the, I mean, the, the age old, right, existential question, why am I here? Why am I here? Well, why am I here is answered for Christians. You're here because you have a clear purpose. You're not existing. You're not just existing. You've been designed to bring God honor in a very peculiar way. So often we get sidetracked by distractions, by, you know, those life distractions, we miss out on what really matters. So as you approach each day, I don't know, when you wake up every morning at five or six or eight or 10 or 11, like some of you, you know, students in here, when you wake up in the morning, what's going through your mind? What's your motivation? Is your motivation grounded, highlighting God or self? What, 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 what do your routines, we all have routines and habits, what do they reveal about your true priorities? Are you producing fruit in your life that reflects his grace and kindness towards sinners? Like what areas of your life do you actually need to go, man, I need to realign. This is not serving God's purpose. I need to realign for God's purpose. Listen, every Christian life, every, every Christian life, every person that went from death to life is dramatically altered by God's glorious grace. So why would we live today as if that's not the purpose of our life, if in fact we are indeed Christians? One more. Glorious grace means I am animated for God's plan. You're like animated? Really, Seth? Animated? You wanted to alliterate, so you chose animated as the last A? Well, I get you. I hear you. Um, but it actually is a great word, if you think about it. Animation, what do you think when you think of animation? You think of movement. You think of taking something static and flat and suddenly making it move. It's, it's, it's to bring, that's what animation means. It means to bring something to life. Think about all those old Disney um, drawings of Mickey Mouse. Remember those back in the day? Back in the day, they're just black and white sketches. They're, they're static, they're, they're, they're flat, but then the artist, Artist to breathe life in frame by painstaking frame. Suddenly, suddenly Mickey's moving and dancing and coming to life and making people laugh and making people, you know, like feel and feel connected. Now, animation has come a long way since then, right? I mean, it's 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 crazy today what what, what how we how we you know enact animation, but it it started with someone looking at a still image and imagining so much more. Now I want you to take that into Ephesians 
Because this is what verse 10 is talking about. Honestly, it's not far from what God does with us. Ephesians 2 says that before God made us alive, we're dead, we're flat, we're lifeless, we're static, we're going nowhere, but God came near. He brought life into us with his spirit. He empowered our steps <laughs> to live out God's plan. That, that is animation. You're like, okay, okay, you got it, animation. Okay, great. What's the plan? The plan is verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Here's the plan. For good works. Now, workmanship, what does that mean? That's where we get our word poem. Did you know that? It's pretty sweet. God's the ultimate artisan. God's the master craftsman. It's where we got our word poem poem. Like, if you think about it, like, when you deface uh, uh, something someone created, that's a pretty, I mean, like, it's a lot different um, defacing a pillar under the expressway as it is to slash the Mona Lisa, right? There's a little bit different thing going on there. But listen, the greatness of the thing slashed determines the degree of the tragedy. And the creator of the universe says that we are his artwork. The greatest artisan of all time, the greatest craftsman of all time created you and created me. Sin defaced, sin slashed. God came near and what sin slashed, Christ renewed. The Bible calls it twice born. Twice born, shaping you and molding you into the image of Christ for good works. What do we do with these good works? Well, first of all, what are good works? I mean, it's pretty, right? Open your Bible. Discipleship, holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, compassion, forgiveness, discipleship, all of these worship. What are we supposed to do? With? What are we supposed to do with these good works? Well, look at what it says. It says we're supposed to do what? Walk in them. Walk in them. We're walking in, and we're not doing it by ourselves. God just doesn't call us to do good works and then sit back and see if we'll succeed. That's not how he rolls. That's not how he works. Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, work out your salvation. What God is working in, you're working out for his good pleasure. He is the one putting the power behind the steps to walk out his plan. And by the way, Good works, his plan, good works, not optional. How many of us kind of just go through life as Christians going, yeah, I don't want to do that. No, I'll do this, but no, I don't want to do that. Listen, that's stinking thinking, okay? That's, <laughs> you're going to get in trouble for that, okay? That's, it, good works are not optional. They are inseparable fruits of genuine salvation. And this is, this is the essence of lordship salvation here. Our profession of faith must be supported by the possession of faith. Our profession of faith has to be, must be supported by the possession of faith. And when Christ is Lord, when he is King of Kings, like we said this morning, when he is our all in all, transformation is visible. His authority is reflected through my good works. This is the plan. So where do I see clear evidence of good works in my life? Where do I see it? Who or what situation highlights those good works? Who or what situation hides those good works? What good works am I neglecting or avoiding in my life? Listen, church, every Christian life is dramatically altered. If you are a Christian by faith and repentance, your life is dramatically altered by grace. You are a different person. You are a new creation. You have new desires and a new will. Grace that does, doesn't just save you from hell, but it transforms you and aligns you and empowers you for purpose. Be amazed. Salvation isn't just some small tweak. It's resurrection from death to life. Stay aligned. 
Our lives, your life, my life is a canvas for his glory, is an opportunity to show the world his kindness. Get busy. You've been crafted to get the work. Get the work. God's life into my steps, his purpose into my days. I'll leave you with three statements and I'm done. Number one, walk in the truth of his grace, okay? If you've never begun today, this is your chance, receive him. Turn from your sin and just receive him. We'll throw up the white flag and just say, God, I'm yours. In Christ, I'm yours. If you've never received him, begin today. If you've drifted, come back today. Come back today. If you've been faithful, amen, endure. Endure today. Keep going today. Secondly, Christian, fight the lies against grace. Satan's gonna come at you with lies. He's, he's really good at the bow and arrow, okay? And a lot of his arrows are deception. Don't let the enemy fool you. Grace isn't a get out of jail free card. It's not a license to sin. It's your empowerment to live boldly for Christ. It's not something to be earned. Jesus already paid for it. You are worthy because he says you're worthy. Believe it. Fight against it. How? By standing firm in the truth. I'm so fired up to go to Ephesians 6. That's a long way away. You're going to have to come back for that one. And that's like going to be this spring. Okay. So Ephesians 6 is going to be awesome because it's all about fighting the battle, standing firm in the truth. Finally, extend the offer of grace. Listen, just as Jesus lavished his rich mercy on you, let's overflow with that same kindness to others. I say it all the time. I'm like a, I'm like a holy Dixie cup. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about like holy with an H. I'm talking about like holy, like, like I have a lot of holes in me. And it's just one more place for grace to leak out, right? God has such supplied us with so much grace. We should be overflowing in our life, not hoarding it, not hiding it, not covering it up. Who needs encouragement? Who needs the gospel in your life? Who needs a listening ear? Who needs forgiveness? Who in your life is just headed down the wrong lane and you just need to confront that person because that's grace. Extend that same grace. Extend that same offer to others in your sphere. Heavenly Father, thank you. We just come before you in awe of your amazing grace, the grace that draws us to you, the grace that empowers us to live for you. God, we thank you for the gift of your son whose death and resurrection have, have secured our salvation, our deliverance. We, we, we confess, like we often, we're just so prone to wander. God, awaken our hearts, refresh our hearts, renew our attitudes. May this be a time as we sing this, this amazing grace, may it be a time of reflection and response. There are some here this morning who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that they would feel the weight of their sin, that they would embrace the beauty of your forgiveness, draw them to yourself so that they may see the glory of your son and embrace the hope found in him alone. Open our eyes, God, to the wonders of your amazing grace at the cross, at the empty tomb, transformed, compelled to declare Jesus to a world desperate in need of grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.